Hi, it's Richard Dwyer from DwyerCrime.blog, also RichardDwyer.com. Today is September the 29th, 2020. Let's talk crime. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. I cannot speak highly enough about a series right now that is on FX. You could also find it on FX on Hulu called A Wilderness of Error about the Jeffrey McDonald murder, right? Let me point out that I've made a video here online about McDonald's, what I believe, murder of his wife Colette, as well as their two young daughters. You can check that video on YouTube. I also believe there are certain key facts that discredit McDonald's story, right? For example, we know that the killer used surgical gloves. A piece of surgical glove is actually found by Colette's body. Well, McDonald kept surgical gloves under the kitchen sink. Hippies, hippie intruders, would not know where to find it in the apartment. More importantly, they wouldn't care whether or not they use surgical gloves. Let me also say too that McDonald's story about having his pajama top wrapped around his wrists as he is fending off stabbings from the intruders simply can't be duplicated. Right? The holes in the pajama top are too pristine. During his trial, the lawyers showed in a demonstration that if what McDonald said was true, the pajama top would have shredded. Right? He supposedly has it around his wrist. He's going like this. He doesn't get badly hurt. The top has straight through holes. McDonald in staging the scene after losing his temper and killing his wife and two young kids seemed to have forgotten the laws of physics didn't seem to realize that poking holes in his pajama top wouldn't conform with the tears the pajama top would have incurred during a struggle with multiple men, supposedly three men, in the living room area while a blonde-haired woman wearing a floppy hat holding a candle talked about acid is groovy, kill the pigs. Right, so McDonald's story has holes. But what they've done in this FX documentary series is they've recreated the crime. They have recreated the apartment. They now can give you an overhead view as if the ceiling is missing of the apartment where the people were supposed to be in the apartment. More importantly, they somehow, and this is almost five full decades after this atrocity, have been able to round up some key people key people, including the prosecutor, including the first people to arrive at the murder scene, what they saw, right? It's simply breathtaking documentary work. I give it my highest recommendation. It is riveting. And for the people who they could not produce live, for the series, like Freddie Kassab, Colette's father, who's a key figure in the McDonald investigation, they've been able to present tape recordings of these individuals because, of course, Kassab started taping conversations with third parties, including Jeffrey McDonald. And the conversations are breathtaking, as are the comments 
of Colette's brother, of Jeffrey McDonald's college roommate who goes on to law school. Now what stood out to me, what I fully, what I did not fully grasp before in reading and researching the McDonald case is just the level of depravity. Understand here online, I'll talk about awful crimes, awful crimes, some involving family members that show a certain depraved heart. But of all the crimes I've talked about here online, the Jeffrey McDonald crime, which includes him killing his pregnant wife, is simply beyond the pale. In the show, they show you that when the military investigators enter the apartment, Jeffrey McDonald is laying next to his wife, right? Supposedly, he needs to be revived. He's overcome, right? His pajama top is on his wife. McDonald has his hand draped across his wife. Right? The scene is jarring because you look at it and you can imagine that if you were a guy and you were in the front room and you woke up, intruders were in your house, your wife was yelling to you, why are they doing this? Right? And then if you were to walk back to the bedroom, find out your wife has been bludgeoned to death. Right? Then you find out that your young children have been bludgeoned to death, that your wife has been stabbed with an ice pick, right, throughout her body, and of course, before the attack, she was pregnant. Then in waiting for the police to arrive, you might lay down with your wife and hug her. Remember how you loved her when she was alive, understanding the loss you've just suffered. I want folks to think about that empathetic, passionate response compared to what I believe happened here. Right? Apparently, Jeffrey's daughter, one of them, the older daughter, was a bedwetter. Now that should raise red flags right there. Right? This young child may have sensed the dysfunction in the family. Understand, on the show, A Wilderness of Error, they even have one of Colette's friends, a close friend, with whom Colette talked about, hinted at some marital problem she was having with Jeffrey, who we know had slept around on her. Right? So I believe Jeffrey McDonald, who is on uppers, goes into the bedroom, his wife has let their child into the bedroom, and the child has wet the bed on Jeffrey's side of the bed. I believe from there things snowball. Right? Jeffrey ends up beating up his wife. Then he kills his daughter. The forensics show that Colette actually gets up after the beating, right? She gets up, walks over toward Jeffrey and the daughter, may have been trying to save the daughter. Jeffrey then goes back into the bedroom, kills his wife, and then the coup de grace, Jeffrey decides to kill his youngest child goes into that bedroom, brutally murders her. Then the cover-up starts. Understand, Jeffrey appears to have put his pajama top over his wife's body and then poked the body, stabbed the body, is a better word, with the ice pick several times. So after that level of depravity, where Jeffrey then decides he has to try to cover up 
the crime scene. He puts on surgical gloves. He then writes the word pig above the bed. Think about that. In his wife's blood. Right? He's staging the crime scene. So when the police come over, rather than being a husband who has just lost his wife to a savage murder by hippie intruders, right? And understand, no candle wax is found dripping in the house, even though the blonde woman with the floppy hat is supposed to have been holding a candle. Right? Just to understand how bad this is. After almost unspeakable crimes, where Jeffrey kills his wife, kills his kids, Jeffrey then goes to the bedroom, lies down next to the woman he has just killed. After opening the door, the back door, and dropping the wooden plank he used to bludgeon his wife and the ice pick in the backyard, right? Understand, the hippie theory falls apart when you realize all of the weapons used in the crime came from inside the house. In other words, this is a home invasion by hippies where they show up to kill people without any weapons without leaving muddy footprints on what was a rainy day. Well, just to understand the level of depravity for Jeffrey McDonald, he's lying with his dead wife, knowing that he's the one who has just killed her, the baby she's carrying and their two young daughters. As I watched The Wilderness of Era, I was just riveted when they find Jeffrey, and of course he plays it off, right? He's overcome. He can barely move. They take him to a hospital. He has a punctured lung, right? By the way, everyone in his family has a different blood type. We know that he's over the sink. His blood is around the sink, which makes no sense until you realize that he was there puncturing his own lung before the police came. Well, what's amazing is the timing. Folks, there's no conscience here, right? He's not, you know, fidgety, anxious, struggling with the idea that he's just committed murder that he's just killed his family, people he loves. Understand, too, this is on an army base. The only reason his wife is there is because he's in the army. Right? She's living his life. She's putting up with a cramped army apartment, even though her husband's a doctor. Because he's her guy and she's supporting him. He kills that woman. And then, of course, is able to just switch gears to put on a show of someone laying down next to her, a victim of a home invasion, for the military folks who show up at the apartment right after it happens. Well, let me just tell you, that scene is jarring enough. There's one that's even more jarring, for me at least. Jeffrey McDonald is at his trial. The prosecution, while he's on the stand, then reveals their big theory of the case, that the holes in Jeffrey McDonald's pajama top correspond with the holes, the ice pick stab wounds on his wife's body. 
Now, McDonald is on the stand. The prosecuting attorney then starts talking to him and lays out the theory. It's devastating if you're the murderer. In other words, while Jeffrey McDonald is under oath, he learns that the prosecutor is in on his secret. Not just that he killed his wife, killed his family, but that he tried to stage it using his pajama top. So in the show, they show Jeffrey McDonald immediately after he leaves the stand. He's outside being questioned. This is not a recreation. This is the actual moment. It's Jeffrey McDonald right after being questioned about putting his pajama top on his wife and stabbing his pregnant wife several times with an ice pick. Right, he had to realize at that point that the state had considerable evidence against him. If you're the murderer and they tell you exactly how you tried to cover up the murder and you understand that they have the pajama top, you understand that they have examined your wife's body. I believe most people, folks with a conscience, would be shaken, especially if they've spent years denying the atrocious crime. Jeffrey McDonald is as cool as a cucumber when questioned by the press who are right outside the courthouse. He says that the prosecution has nothing. He makes the claim that they're trying to develop a theory of the case through him on the stand. Let me just say, the prosecutor was excellent. They play tapes from the trial. The prosecutor was magnificent. The phrasing of the question was perfect. It pinned Jeffrey McDonald in. He had to realize that he was up against excellent lawyers. Right? McDonald's lawyer was excellent, Bernie Siegel. He had to realize that this was not only a well-publicized prosecution, this was a well-done prosecution. So as he sat on the stand, he had to realize, my God, they've solved it. Why didn't I think of that in the moment when I was stabbing my wife through my pajama top? But yet, moments later, he's out of the court and he's unshaken. Folks, this is a clear example, clear, in my mind at least, of a psychopath. I have to tell you, I was watching this series. So far, three episodes have played. There'll be more, right? It's five star. You know, I was nauseated at the beginning when they showed the murder scene. I thought to myself, what could be worse than this? When I saw Jeffrey McDonald talking after testifying on the stand, right after he left the courthouse, I almost couldn't watch it. I was just looking at his affect. This is worse than his appearance on the Dick Cavett show. Because at least on the Dick Cavett show, he didn't just learn while he's under oath that the police figured out that the pattern of the stab wounds, the holes in his pajama top matched the stab wounds on his wife. And for him to then lie to the press brazenly and say they have nothing when the prosecution had cracked the case, the prosecution had everything, was just jarring. Now let's talk about a mistake. 
it's not discussed enough. Right, Jeffrey McDonald's defense, and they did a good job, but maybe they didn't do the right job, made a mistake that may have cost them the entire case. It's jarring, but on the show, they have the military investigator. He's in his early 20s. He's in a car with another military investigator. McDonald has called in the fact that he needs an ambulance, that people have been hurt at his place. And so, of course, two guys are in a car. They were on the army base. They're headed to McDonald's apartment. Right? The guy in the passenger seat who's on a wilderness of era. As you can imagine, he's much older now. But he claims that he looks out the car. It's a rainy day. And incredibly, under an awning, he claims he saw, this is before talking to McDonald, before knowing McDonald's version of events, he claims that he saw a blonde woman wearing a floppy white hat. It registered with him because it was raining outside and because she shouldn't have been there. They show you the building. Right? It's not an apartment. It's some other building on an army base. Right? He looks out the car and he sees a blonde woman with a floppy hat. Now here's where it gets provocative. This guy knew Helena Stokely, the woman who the McDonald camp later claimed was the woman wearing the floppy hat, right? Holding the candle saying acid is groovy, right? This guy knew Elena Stokely. And he claims, and he says it here on camera, that the woman he saw on his way to the murder scene was not Helena Stokely. Well, you know what happens? They get to the murder scene. Jeffrey McDonald, a psychopath who may have known that there was a blonde woman that he might have seen at some time wearing a floppy white hat who was around town, right? Incorporated that into his story. He's telling the police about a woman wearing a floppy white hat. This is the very early 70s. The cops know a woman with a floppy white hat. Helena Stokely. But understand, Helena Stokely has a massive drug problem. She's using acid. Right? She is in town, right, days after the murder. And, of course, what's she wearing? A floppy white hat. Elena Stokely, who was not the woman, right, not the woman that the military investigator saw that night, right, Helena, Helena Stokely then becomes the focal point of the McDonald defense because she tells several people that she was there that night. But then she also claims that she can't remember that night, that she wasn't there that night. At some point, the police give her a lie detector test. Helena Stokely, who was heavily into drugs, did not know whether she was there that night or not. Right? Doesn't know. Now, the McDonald defense thought that Helena Stokely on the stand 
would own up to the fact that she had talked to other people. Forget the fact that whatever story she said wouldn't conform with the evidence, right? The use of a surgical glove. The fibers from McDonald's pajama top being found under Colette's body, which doesn't match up with McDonald's story. Right? Forget the fact that Helena Stokely's story doesn't match the forensics. The McDonald people thought that if they called her as a witness to testify, she would have to, in court, own up to the fact that she had told several people that she thought she might have been there. Right? They call her at the McDonald trial. She takes a stand. The best she can say is that she doesn't remember being there. Right? She's unreliable. Now, my point to you, and it's a big point, by the way, YouTube videos of Helena Stokely are on YouTube. Right? Look at the interviews. It's clear from those interviews that Stokely, who died young, is a druggie who has a fragmented memory. Right? The judge did not allow McDonald's team to introduce evidence from the people who heard Stokely's confessions at the trial, feeling that Stokely, who herself is unreliable, may have given unreliable confessions to the different people that Stokely had been inconsistent in the past. Right? Given Stokely's lack of awareness under oath, the judge didn't allow the many people who Stokely told that she was there. Right? Now understand, Bernie Siegel, as brilliant as he was as an attorney, and they have a member of the defense's team on this Wilderness of Error show, right? As brilliant as McDonald's attorneys were, they never produced, they never pursued fully, they never found the blonde woman wearing the floppy white hat that the military investigator saw on his way to the crime scene before ever hearing Jeffrey McDonald refer to a blonde girl wearing a floppy hat. Right? Had they found that witness? In other words, they had two blonde women with floppy hats. Right? The one who would have been convincing, the one they perhaps should have pursued, was the one who was near McDonald's apartment at the time of the murders. Understand it's very powerful when a military investigator, even though he is young, 23, has to admit that he saw this woman. By the way, he mentions it to military authorities early on. This information was out there. I want people to consider the idea that it's the early 70s that more than one woman in town is wearing a floppy hat. That there may have been multiple women in town wearing floppy hats. I'm not saying any of them were involved in the murder. Right? By hanging their defense on Helena Stokely, a woman who was deeply into drugs, incoherent, right, roaming around town days after the murder, wearing a white floppy hat, right, tells the cops one thing one day, tells them another thing another day. Right? By trying to hang 
complicity in the murder on Helena Stokely. McDonald's defense team may have failed to produce the actual woman blonde woman with the floppy hat who was around the murder scene. Right? Think about that as you watch the show. Because it is jarring. What I think actually happened, and this is purely speculation on my part. Right? I don't believe there's a woman with a floppy hat ever at the Jeffrey McDonald apartment. Right? I don't. But I do think McDonald's a brilliant individual, right? I understand he went to Princeton, elite student all throughout his career, um, very high achiever. So I believe this guy, after he kills his wife, when he starts piecing together an alibi, when he goes back out to the living room and is looking through the Esquire magazine right there's a paucity of blood in the living room apparently that magazine has some blood on it as he's looking through the Esquire magazine he comes across the Charles Manson story which no doubt was in the news and then he decides okay I need to frame this as a hippie invasion murder I need to write pig on the top part of the bed. Right? I need to frame hippies. Who are the hippies I know? Who are the hippies I might not know? Who I've seen? Oh. They're women wearing floppy hats. I saw a blonde woman wearing a floppy hat. Let me incorporate her into my story. Understand, it happens fast. He makes the call after he staged the scene. He lies down next to his wife. The police are there within minutes. He's taken to a hospital. They then have interviewers come into his hospital room when he comes to, and I believe it's all an acting job, he tells his story. If he saw a woman in town wearing a white floppy hat who could pass for a hippie, he throws her into the story. Right? One of the invaders is supposed to be a black guy. Right? He throws the black guy into the story. Right? No doubt he saw a black guy in town. He's trying to create a narrative that's believable. Right? He needs to paint people as outsiders. Right? Folks who disrespect the system. In 1970, right? Less racially enlightened times, he of course is going to pull a Susan Smith and blame a black person. So it's a black guy, two white guys, white blonde girl. And of course, she's there holding a candle. Who brings a candle on a rainy day? How did the candle not go out before they walk into the apartment? On a rainy day, who brings a candle into a mass murder where you're going to be murdering children? So, five stars to a wilderness of error. I believe one of those errors, and understand the filmmaker doubts that McDonald's guilty, right? I believe one of those errors was committed by McDonald's defense team. The woman with the floppy hat that they should have focused on wasn't the unreliable Helena Stokely. It should have been the other woman who the military investigator saw before reaching the murder scene. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I'll leave a link about a wilderness of error in the comment section of this video so you can get the information directly yourself.
thanks for stopping by. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Thank you.